going to introduce you. And I'm just so grateful for you to come talk to our group. Uh, Mario Mendez is a, a behavioral neurologist, and he is at UCLA. And he, I think you're the protege of, of Dr. Benson, but you'll tell us all about that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Welcome to our Zoom lecture on posterior cortical atrophy. And I would say easily that you probably are the most knowledgeable person um, in, in this world on PCA. So hopefully we will learn a lot and this will be taped. So thank you. You can share your screen if you want, or you can just talk. Thank you uh, very much. That is uh, quite an introduction. I have to live up to this, particularly since uh, people have invited me into their home. It's, uh, kind of, uh, I'm nervous, uh, but uh, I re really appreciate this. Um, I'm going to uh, show you uh, some slides and uh, hopefully I will know how to do this. I've never done this before. I'm a little rusty, but uh, uh, bear with me and uh, we will see what we can do. Well, you got your slides up. That's awesome. Okay. And um, do you see the full screen? Yep. Or just a partial screen uh, with a, a side window? Yes. We see um, a, a Oliver Sacks, a young, very young Oliver Sacks on a motorcycle. And that's all on the screen. That's yes. the only thing on the screen. And, and, and Oliver Sacks, who trained in, in neurology at UCLA, described PCA and the man who mistook his wife for hat. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about posterior critical atrophy, as uh, all of you are aware. Uh, this is a disorder of complex uh, visual perception. And I was uh, most uh, fortunate uh, to train under uh, D. Frank Benson, who originally described uh, this uh, condition in 1988 in a series of patients. Dr. Benson was my mentor. I uh, loved him. Uh, he was a great guy, and uh, he was uh, quite a luminary. I mean, he could see things uh, that other people uh, couldn't. Um, I learned a great deal from him, and sometimes uh, people still refer to PCA as uh, Benson's uh, disease. It also happens uh, that our, at our institution at UCLA, we had uh, what turns out to be the world's most famous neurologist, Oliver Sacks. This is Oliver Sacks when he was a neurology resident in the 60s, before my time, zooming around Santa Monica uh, on his motorcycle, causing uh, the directors of the program a lot of grief. But he too was a luminary, and he too could see things that other people couldn't. These are amazing people. And uh, back then, he didn't know uh, what he was uh, that this was uh, PCA, but he wrote his first, his most famous book still, I think, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and of course, that was a patient uh, with posterior cortical uh, atrophy. So that's the history of uh, this condition uh, at my institution. So let's talk a little bit about what uh, PCA is. First of all, it's a syndrome. What is a syndrome? A syndrome is a collection of symptoms that travel together. Um, we, it doesn't necessarily imply a specific disease. Now, this is important because we often assume that uh, when we diagnose something like PCA, we have uh, proof uh, of what's under the microscope, what the pathology is. In actual fact, uh, it's just a collection of, sim of symptoms um, that is most likely to be, uh, for example, uh, Alzheimer's disease in 75 to 80% on autopsy, but it can be a number of other things, uh, such as dementia with Lewy bodies, the Heidenham variant of crutchfield jacob disease, which is prion disease, which is mad cow disease. It's very, 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 very rare, so please uh, don't be alarmed. Uh, um, and uh, cortical basal degeneration. So again, uh, PCA is a vi complex visual syndrome which may have different 
findings under the microscope. Some basic facts. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that this is an early onset condition uh, on average. That is under the age of 65, 58.2 years mean onset uh, with a wide variance. Progressive complex visual symptoms, better verbal fluency, less memory impairment, and more depression than Alzheimer's disease. And a relative preservation of insight into the illness, which is uh, difficult. It's really difficult because people see themselves with uh, the accumulation of visual impairments. Um, this is uh, from uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Schott uh, and Sebastian Crutch in their, uh, some of their wonderful publications showing a date of age of onset among 302 patients. And you can see that it's basically uh, a mean, if you were to take an average, around the uh, late uh, 50s. So let's talk about what kind of visual syndrome this is. It's not a primary visual syndrome. It's not about the eyes. It's not about uh, the, the, the tracks. It's not about the optic nerves. It's, uh, uh, or the lateral geniculate ganglion or all the pathways even past uh, primary visual cortex. It's really about complex visual uh, symptoms. Most common presentations are difficulty with distances and location. So the GPS system at the cortex is involved. And that's a, at a level of perception where you're putting things together in the brain in order to localize in space. Uh, the stability of static images uh, may be altered such that uh, items are lost when you're fixating on them or they may appear to move. Reading is a major complaint. I think in our series, uh, reading was the number one reason to come and see us. Uh, reading is a very complex visual um, task. Walking on irregular surfaces is another uh, complaint. Basic vision tends to be intact, uh, except for some alteration in visual fields. Uh, on uh, visual field testing, the eye doctor may see that uh, particularly the left side of hemi uh, space may be less attended to or actually uh, not quite seen. On testing, PCA primarily affects mid-level vision, especially in the dorsal visual stream. So for the rest of this discussion, I want to talk about how this perception is affected in the brain. And then we'll talk about some symptoms and uh, neuroimaging and a few things about management that we know. First of all, perception. I think of uh, this as a perceptual disorder. So what is perception? Perception is what your brain reconstructs from sensory input. Perception is in your brain. Perception is not out in the real world. Uh, traditionally, people ask, what is red? Well, red is a uh, area in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and that electromagnetic uh, waveform uh, strikes uh, the retina. Uh, and the different levels of nerves from there on translated into uh, digital data. And that digital data is eventually goes to the brain where the process of reconstruction begins. And as you reconstruct something, it's not 100% uh, the same as what is out there in the, in the world. So that, uh, and this is important to us uh, in neurology because we can use the rules of reconstruction in order to develop tests uh, for diagnosis. So again, things are received uh, in the eye, they're encoded into neuro neuronal signals, and eventually they reach the brain where things are, are brought together in perception. Now, there are two streams that do this. Uh, we've known for a long time that there's a what stream and a where stream. The where stream travels north here, which is dorsal, and the what stream travels south, which is ventral. And what PCA affects most is this what stream. So that's spatial concepts, that's where spatial concepts 
the GPS system, as I call it, is particularly affected. Um, the ability to localize in space and find what you need, where you need it, put everything together uh, into a unified uh, image. This is another illustration of the dorsal pathway uh, and the ventral pathway. And you can see the dorsal pathway up here and the ventral pathway down here. Uh, and they do different things. We're primarily uh, concerned about an illness that uh, has its greatest focus in this region, more affecting dorsal pathways and spatial concepts. A number of years ago, we reviewed an early series of uh, patients uh, at UCLA with uh, complex visual disorders who proved to have PCA. Among these 84 patients, uh, 67 presented with reading difficulty, which we call alexia. That reading difficulty uh, was uh, quite pronounced in the visual modality, yet uh, they had less difficulty in the oral modality. Then they had what's called balance syndrome. Balance syndrome is a spatial disorder in localizing in space where you can only see one item at a time, more or less. Uh, you cannot put it together, that's called simultaneous nausea. And you can't move your hands, arms, or eyes to visual stimuli. So it's the quintessential problem in localization in the GPS system. Then there's the uh, third item here on this list, which is visual agnosia, which is inability to recognize objects. That's more in the ventral stream. Problems getting around in space, environmental disorientation, dressing, uh, pretty orienting your body to your clothes, recognizing faces, colors, and I've already mentioned the hemispatial on the left uh, problem. So, um, just to recap on balance syndrome, simultaneous nausea, can't see more than one stimulus, and oculomotor apraxia and optic apraxia are basically that you can't direct your eyes or your hands to a visual stimulus in space. Okay, so how do we test patients? Well, we, we uh, are focus on these symptoms, which are complex visual sy symptoms, and we focus on disturbances in perception or this reconstruction. That leads us to the following tests object and shape matching, visual cancellation, visual matrices, completion, global local precedence, contour integration, rotated object comparisons. And I'm gonna show you some examples of these special perception tests. Um, so we can move from this slide. Um, but first, let me just describe a typical patient for us to set the stage for these tests. 58-year-old lady with a two-year history of a progressive difficulty localizing things in her environment, you know, finding the milk in the refrigerator or uh, finding things in a drawer or even things in a closet, uh, getting around in, in space. Can't lo uh, locate people even when they're close, can't easily see items in a kitchen or closet. During meals, knocks things over trouble locating utensils on the table, puts glass down and the glass seems to fall on the floor because she missed the table, can't find steps, stairs, or road signs. This is very, very uh, dangerous. Uh, well, not to alarm uh, everyone, but uh, the steps are, uh, people fall, they can't see that step. Uh, it, there, um, there are, uh, monocular cues to depth. It's not all stereopsis or the disparity between the two eyes. So this is also a complex uh, perceptual uh, issue. And then items disappear uh, from the primary field of view. I mentioned the uh, static images may move. Um, difficulty dressing. Uh, this is a woman. She couldn't figure out how to how to put on her clothes, uh, just getting a, a limb through a sleeve or a pant leg can be a chore. I've mentioned reading. 
difficulty finding the next line on the page also reading a map i've mentioned depth perception and eventually some difficulty with memory calculations and other things now uh, most commonly uh, the physician does simple constructions uh, copying items such as these on the, the left side on the right side you can see that they are disordered and that requires perception oh i'm uh, going too fast here this is uh, from uh, shop and crutch originates from uh, elizabeth warrington elizabeth warrington by the way is an amazing pioneer she's a uh, uh, the Dean of British uh, Neuropsychology. Uh, she is uh, a genius and she's come up with so many things and discovered so many things. These are fragmented letters and the difficulty in putting them together reflects a perceptual problem because obviously you have this representational reconstruction, putting it all together in the brain into an, into, uh, an image that can be recognized. This is from our perceptual assessment battery, putting this figure together, which is a man on a horse. This is from Alexander Lurius, uh, uh, original crosshatch figures, when you can't tell the figure from the ground, the foreground from the background, and just searching for the dots to circle them. Um, and this is again a street or, uh, figure putting together the face. Um, now, figure ground objects can be quite difficult uh, in PCA. Um, this is a popple rooter type of figure where there are several superimposed uh, items, line drawings. Finding out where the boundaries are is a, is a very important perceptual issue. This is very difficult for patients. Uh, again, these are some of the tests that we use in clinic in order to diagnose complex visual disturbances at the perceptual level and not due to the eyes, uh, primarily due to the eyes or um, other parts of the brain. Uh, this is, this is um, a uh, figure that's often used uh, for color blindness, uh, but sometimes uh, they're also, they can also be uh, useful for complex visual changes. Um, and these are called Navan figures where people cannot see the large letters because of the small ones. Now I want to point out uh, eye tracking studies. Eye tracking studies uh, are, when you can do them, are among the most uh, useful because they play right into this ability to search the environment and put everything together. Uh, so obviously looking at how the eyes move is extremely informative. This is an eye tracking study from Yang et al. And uh, just, you can see the red lines, um, instead of the blue lines, the blue lines is, the blue lines are how you would normally go down in, in English from left to right and then come back and find the next line and so on and so forth. Um, this patient uh, moves all around the page, cannot find the next line. And this is one of the reasons why they have such a problem with reading. Uh, also, they just can't localize. They can't find, uh, this is just a dot circling test uh, that we have. You have to just find every dot on the page and put a circle around it. Sometimes they go over the same dot over and over again, come back to it, uh, but they can't find all the dots correctly to put everything together. Again, you can see the spatial aspect of this. Um, you, we think of it so much as visual, but space, uh, a lot of the posterior part of the human brain is dealing with uh, the, all the personal maps, extra personal maps, uh, and so on that we use to process space. Uh, this is another um, eye tracking study. And, uh, a is a normal person at a beach. That person goes from the pier to the beach, uh, and the numbers reflect how long the fixation period is. So this is a normal eye tracking study where uh, important items are processed. Below is a patient with posterior cortical atrophy. 
that patient uh, seems unable to process many of the important items in the visual image that they're looking at so that they may miss all the people on the beach, uh, even though they're quite in front of them. And you can see how that's a spatial item. Um, uh, pictures like this are often uh, impossible. This is what uh, um, my colleague at Mayo Clinic uh, uses uh, for local localizing in a complex scene. This is an artistic's, uh, an artist's uh, rendition of how you might see um, in PCA. You might just see these different aspects, but never put it all together into a single image. Now I'm going to move on to uh, neuroimaging because we, once we do these tests and we find that the patient who presented with a complex visual complaint uh, has a disturbance in one of these complex visual tests, then we go on to corroborate our impression by looking at both structural and now functional imaging uh, where available. Uh, this is uh, one of my patients, and there's a, uh, uh, if you put your hand, if you were to put your hand in front of, uh, say, the bottom part, cover it up, and then uncover it and put the hand on the top part, you can see that there's a difference in tissue. That is, there's atrophy uh, with enlargement of the cavities, the dark cavities, posteriorly indicating posterior cortical atrophy. I, I hope you can uh, see that. Maybe this uh, next image uh, with the arrow helps pointing it out. Now, um, this line over here is uh, actually um, a, the black line and the image on the right is a functional image. So we're going from structure, anatomy, to function. Uh, and it's usually a sugar or glucose, fluorodeoxyglucose radioisotope PET scan, positron emission tomography scan, showing what parts of the brain are not working. And again, uh, here you see that the posterior part is not working as well. So on the left, you have the structure. On the right, you have the function. Um, this is a very prominent patient that with a functional PET scan, an FTG PET scan, where uh, the image is quite unequivocal, showing uh, amazing wipeout in the posterior cortex. Uh, it's all whited out here. It should be dark, uh, particularly along the rim, um, as you see uh, from the frontal region. That should be pretty clear. Uh, and I wanna show this image because it uh, illustrates where we're heading, what the future is, what the pathology is. For a long time, we felt that uh, there was a, a posterior uh, shift of some elements of Alzheimer's disease in at least 75% of patients, and that's what you saw under the microscope. And this shift uh, is reflected in tau, abnormal hyperphosphorylated tau protein, which is a normal structure uh, of the axons of the uh, microtubular aspect of the act. It's kind of uh, the scaffolding, if you will. Uh, and this scaffolding protein uh, somehow gets all crinkled up. It forms three-dimensional bonds and it, as it gets crinkled up, it precipitates out. It becomes insoluble. That is uh, like a, 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 you know, trying to dissolve something in water and all of a sudden it, it, uh, it, co it coagulates and it precipitates out. Um, and it, it then is deposited in the cort cortical part of the brain posteriorly. You can see it here as an area of activity because this new tau pet tracer, which is a uh, major advance uh, in our science, shows where it is taken up. And in this case, it's taken up posteriorly. You can see how PCA in most patients is a form of uh, Alzheimer pathology characterized by hyperphosphorylated tau, which precipitates out 
in the posterior neocortex and lights up on a tau scan. Um, they take the form of neurofibrillary tangles. Um, there is amyloid there as well. The amyloid is not specific in its lo localization. Now, uh, over the last few years, we've done uh, work uh, looking at uh, uh, expanding on uh, Migliaccio's work and others, looking at tracks, because we think that different tracks are involved than the usual tracks in typical Alzheimer's disease. That is, there is relative sparing of the memory centers and uh, of the uh, default mode network and some of the other uh, typical pathways of spread of the illness in regular Alzheimer's. In uh, this condition, there seems to be an alternate uh, tract or, or pathway or network that is involved in its uh, spread. We as yet don't know why, why an alternate pathway would lead to deposition of this uh, abnormal tau in the complex visual areas posteriorly. We don't know uh, uh, what sets it off. Uh, we're unclear of uh, risk factors, environmental events. Uh, the vast majority of time, there is no gene that it's not a, uh, it would be rare for it to be associated with uh, early onset familial Alzheimer's disease, which are a uh, number of autosomal dominant genes. Um, so it's a, it's, it remains a, a mystery why you have this alternate pathway and alternate uh, involvement uh, of this complex uh, visual region. Um, some of our own work has been looking at uh, graph theory and uh, other ways to plot the involvement of the tracks. Um, PCA is involved in this type 2 Alzheimer's disease patient. Uh, we think that we can follow the different connections and dissect them out. It's complex mathematics. I don't personally do it. And uh, there are people that co we collaborate with uh, that are trying to figure this out. And by figuring out how this illness spreads this abnormal hyperphosphorylated tau, um, we hope to find out what the trigger is. Um, uh, let me uh, briefly mention a few other tests uh, that you might be aware of. Uh, we, we did a, a, an evaluation of uh, Alzheimer proteins in the spinal fluid in posterior uh, cortical uh, atrophy and, and other early onset cognitive syndromes like logopenic progressive aphasia, regular amnestic Alzheimer's disease. And um, what was intriguing to us is that the actual tau uh, represented here by 42% and 9% was not elevated in comparison to other forms of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it seems to be sequestered in some way, possibly in that posterior cortex. Uh, and then uh, on pathology, this is an important work by Murray et al, uh, because what it shows here, what you're looking at, is what Alzheimer looks like to the pathologist under the microscope. The pathologist sees typical Alzheimer's disease, this bar in the middle. Those patients uh, have involvement of the hippocampal structures, the memory centers, and the mesial temporal regions, and the precuneus, and other specific areas that are known to be the focus, the foci of Alzheimer neuropathology. There is a small group of elderly people who are more uh, involvement of the limbic region, but what we see are relatively young people, um, including posterior cortical atrophy, who have hippocampal sparing. That means that they are not involving the typical memory centers early on, and they are starting out somewhere else with a different track uh, and a different trajectory into the posterior visual cortex. Um, okay, so before I conclude, uh, just a few um, other items uh, that I want to 
tell you about. There are a lot of unusual symptoms in PCA. We, we, uh, we're, we, we're cataloging them, so to, so to speak. We don't really understand most of them, uh, but they are an area of research. Often there's light glare uh, sensitivity that's out of proportion to their other symptoms. Visual disorientation can extend beyond what I've mentioned. Um, visual objects may disappear when they're looking at them, which uh, yet static objects may move. There's a reverse size effect sometimes. Uh, sometimes you can see it in reading where smaller things um, are read more easily than larger letters. Visual crowding can be a real problem. Pelinopsia is a condition where images persist even after you move your eyes away. Akinatopsia is a, is a strange uh, condition where people cannot have particular problem with the detection of motion. We've had several PCA patients who have, uh, some have been facilitated by motion, but others uh, cannot see uh, things as a move in particular. Um, for example, we had a, a, a patient who uh, couldn't see cars coming uh, from her left side into, and it's often directional, into the right side. And that was very dangerous for her crossing the street. Or um, The moving images will break up into stills, uh, like a film, like holding up a film. Um, and uh, some people have had problems with the detection of texture or patterns. Uh, Picture agnosia, I've already mentioned. Uh, uh, agnosia is the Greek word for lack of knowledge of. Me, uh, in this context, it means that they can't figure out what they're seeing in a picture. Abnormal depth perception, monocular depth cues, such as uh, perspective, uh, superimposition, um, where one thing is on, in, appears in front of the other that gives it depth. Um, the uh, uh, relative size and so on uh, can be quite disturbed. Um, problems with visual local capture, magnetic misreaching with their hands. They, when they reach out to grab something in the environment, it goes straight to your face. Uh, uh, the examiner sitting in front of the patient can uh, often they can track moving objects but not localize them. The room may appear tilted. There may be prolonged color after images. Uh, and there's a mirror sign where things repeat. Uh, a, a number of years ago, I think this, uh, I want to show this uh, paper because, and it's thanks to Dr. Crutch actually, got all of us together and said, we need to do something about criteria. We need to do something about uh, clarifying what's going on. And we did get together. Uh, we wrote a paper on this. And that uh, eventually led to this working group moving on to developing specific uh, criteria modified from uh, some of our older criteria. Insidious onset and gradual progression, prominent early visual perceptual visual spatial impairments, relatively spared other cognitive areas, absence of other diseases, uh, and supportive features like early onset, Gerstmann syndrome, apraxia, idiomotor apraxia, and the neuroimaging changes that I showed you. So we now have uh, criteria. Now that's, uh, it took a working group and people from around the world to come together and decide how are, are we going to uniform, uniformly diagnose this condition. Management. Uh, just to conclude with management, uh, there are many things to do. And one of the great things I think uh, David uh, Tangway up in Canada and Toronto has uh, put out uh, a list of uh, suggestions uh, for patients and families, which is excellent, excellent, really. Uh, I use it. I'm very grateful to him for, for it. One of the things we uh, like to emphasize is depression because so many patients see themselves 
they have insight, they have frontal lobes that are working. And uh, the depression makes things so much worse. We use uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease medications. Uh, sometimes they help, even though they have been developed uh, for the memory circuitry. If we suspect that it's not Alzheimer's, but Lewy body or cortical basal, then we might try a whole list of other medications related to uh, atypical Parkinson conditions. Um, we have services for the partially sighted, uh, which includes uh, books on tape, uh, visual aids, uh, and a whole list of other things, as well as uh, some uh, dedicated support groups that work on this. Uh, we spend a lot of time with uh, specific instructions on how to man manage the visual Im impairments, such as Dr. Tang Wei's recommendations. There are visual rehabilitation services, and of course, psychosocial support uh, is uh, crucial. So uh, just to conclude what we've talked about here, um, some basic things. PCA is usually an early onset variant of Alzheimer's disease with, with uh, an unusual deposition of, of tau neurofibrillary tangles, uh, which progresses, unfortunately, but it can progress very slowly. We've had patients with this illness for nearly 20 years. Uh, and it, of the variants, it's probably the one who progresses the slowest. Uh, patients have other cognition that they can rely on and can do, if you give them support, they can often do uh, quite well. You must uh, consider other conditions uh, beyond Alzheimer's disease as well, of course. Um, PCA presents with a range of complex visual complaints, which I've shown you. And they often go from one eye specialist to another before somebody realizes it's not in the eye, the optic tracts, the optic nerves, it's in the brain. It's in perception, not vision itself. Uh, brain imaging now shows distinctive posterior involvement, uh, including the revolutionary new tau imaging where we can actually take a picture of uh, PCA. And we're just beginning to investigate the unique uh, neurobiological basis of uh, PCA. We're really at the uh, uh, early stages. We have a long way to go. So with that, I, I wanna conclude, uh, thank you. You're, I don't know if you're tuning in from multiple countries, so excuse me if I don't have your language on there. Uh, thank you so much. That was awesome. And I'm going to not. So the way we work now is if you could turn off your slides and we're just going to talk. You can just, you know, kind of uh, undo. OK, perfect. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the first question because I've got a million thoughts running through my mind. And then everybody who is interested, just raise your hand and I will unmute you but I go first, I go first. So I'm, I want to understand like what Frank Benson saw and how come people hadn't seen that before or how, you know, how, how come it wasn't described. And once he saw this, it was in 1988, we, you know, we did have PET scans, right? We did have MRIs. How did he go about figuring out that it was related to Alzheimer's? Well, uh, Frank, uh, one of the characteristics of Frank is that he is one of the country's greatest brain behavior physicians. He understood how the brain worked. And he understood that a lot of vision is not in the visual system uh, from the primary visual cortex onto the eyes. There is really a whole process of reconstruction, of perceptual reconstruction. And, and what we were seeing were problems in the perceptual part of the brain. Uh, heretofore, most uh, clinicians were considering the problem as visual in the brain, and not, and not necessarily in the brain, but in the whole visual system from uh, the eyes uh, to the stride cortex, which is primary visual cortex. Uh, 
So one of his insights was to say, no, this is beyond that. This is going into a higher level of the brain. And as he uh, evaluated these patients, he, he saw that there was an insidious onset and a gradual progression, which is the hallmark of a neurodegenerative disorder. That time course is what we look at to see if it could be a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, and some of those early scans uh, at that time, uh, I remember CAT scans and so on, were showing um, relative atrophy in the posterior part of the brain. And that's how he arrived at uh, PCA. It's so interesting. And in terms of, of where, do, do people with Alzheimer's, like later on, I think they also have visual problems, but is it, are they the same types? Do, does it spread towards the back of the brain in patients who start with an amnestic problem? Uh, yes. So the big three in typical Alzheimer's disease is early difficulty with memory, episodic declarative new learning type of memory, uh, given, you know, we test with a list of things and they can't remember them five minutes later type of thing. Um, number two, they have uh, problems with word finding, um, usually a semantic difficulty with uh, the at the semantic level of understanding the words. And number three, they have, uh, they begin to have problems with visual spatial constructions uh, at a very minor, uh, to, to, in comparison to PCA to a minor degree, so that uh, some of the three-dimensional drawings uh, they can't do, or they can't do uh, in the neuropsychological lab, a ray complex figure, it becomes, uh, uh, it breaks down, but these other, these this other panoply of uh, uh, broad, complex visual disturbances, they don't, they don't, they may never get, they may never get those things. Now, the way a typical Alzheimer's disease spreads is, uh, we think, is that it it spreads from mesial temporal region. This is called Bracken Brock staging of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, per, uh, Interrhinal cortex, uh, uh, parahippocamp uh, the hippocampus, and into the mesial parts of the parietal area, pecunius, posterior cingula, uh, and um, not exactly the same regions as we we see uh, early PCA, the involvement in early PCA. So there are those differences in, in localization. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to let others. Uh, yes, uh, Cecil, I'm going to take you off of your unmute. Hi, Cecil. Wait, I think you have to do it yourself because it's not working on mine. Thank you. Reaching in the wrong direction. <laughs> I do that all the time. Uh, uh, th this, this is a frustrating thing. I can't do anything dangerous anymore because I, I can't tell which way it's going to go when I want it to go. Re even taking cookies out of the oven, I did it with the hot pad in one hand, but I grabbed it with the other. Okay, reaching in the wrong direction. This is a this this progresses then and uh, is something I need to really uh, work on coping with. Um, yes, sir. I think. Uh... That is part of the GPS system. Uh, that's my euphemism for it, my analogy for it, uh, is just localizing. Directional localization is particularly bad on average in, in left hemispace, on the left side of the body. Uh, but some people have more problems on the right side. We don't know why, but uh, just finding things uh, going in the right direction it can be a a progressive uh, problem, yes. Okay, thank you, Cecil. Now, if anybody has a question on the phone, you can just kind of, there's a little thing that says chat. You can just let me know that you wanna uh, ask something and then I will uh, unmute you there. Does anybody else have any uh, other questions for Dr. Mendes or any comments about your symptoms or uh, you might want to discuss, Dr. Mendes, um, research, how patients might 
you know, become involved in research because I think that a lot of neurologists, I've, I've met many neurologists who've never even heard of PCA. And I see a question, Bob, uh, you'll answer that in a question. Let's, hi, Bob, thank you. I, I, I just have to, I, I look at this and it's so informative and so over my head, uh, but I have all of the, what I saw today, every part of it. Just the other day, I was in a restaurant with my care partner, Barbara, and uh, <laughs> the glass went right off the table. <laughs> and I didn't really realize it at first until I got, the guy was sweeping the floor and picking up the glass and stuff. So it's, it's, I have all these these indications that I have it. And I was very lucky because uh, I was diagnosed in Reno, Nevada, and it was just Alzheimer's. Um, but I came to uh, realize that it was more difficult. And uh, Barbara and I have known each other for some time, and she agreed to be my par care partner. But I, I have... Uh, as I'm doing now, sometimes I forget where I'm at, that uh, I found in H uh, C University of Colorado, uh, they have great doctors there, and Dr. Victoria Pellick is my uh, ophthalmologist, a neuro-ophthalmologist, and she is, uh, she is very good, and she has a great team here. So I'm glad that I'm here with them. Wonderful, thank you so much, Bob. Dr. Mendes, do you want to answer that question uh, before there's another question about how people can get involved with research if they want to? Um, well, the, I would check with your local, because obviously it's going to be regionally dependent. Yeah. Um, whether there's any research project going on, either in neurology or ophthalmology. Uh, we, we have an um, NIH-funded project in this area and we're trying to characterize, as you, as I showed you, what kind of tracks are involved, uh, why different tracks are involved compared to typical Alzheimer's disease, what tests are best to diagnose PCA, uh, and so on. So I would uh, look to see what to, what your local university, what project is going on. Now, clinical drug trials, uh, we need to proceed into clinical drug trials. There are some clinical drug trials that, uh, that once they know that it's Alzheimer's disease, uh, accept PCA patients, but many others do not. So that's, uh, that's another frontier, experimental <laughs> clinical drug trials. I think the problem has been that if people would have your biomarkers, your tests, that you use, obviously you have to design, they can't take the standard tests because they, they do so well on memory and, and that's not their problem. So I think that's been a, a big problem that I've seen in the field of, of clinical research. Patients can't get in because they do so well on, on many of the tests that are now used to, uh, to track and, and progression. Oh, that's an excellent point and I should have said it myself actually is you, you need outcome variables that you can measure so that limits uh, variance like PCA and other conditions actually. Uh, if you have to have a measurement that you take, test on entry, and then six months, one year, and so on down the line to see if there was an effect of whatever intervention that you initiated. And uh, there is no standardization of that right now in P PCA. That's, that's terrific. Any other questions? Yes, um, Dan, and wait, you, can you unmute yourself, please? Um, what do you think about the new finding, possibly, of that gingivitis may be the cause of Alzheimer's and dementia? Um, it's very intriguing, and uh, it's been... Uh, promoted before, as well as other infections in the gut and other parts of the body, uh, immune reactions to them and so on. But like a lot of these things, uh, they need replication before, before you can really be confident 
about them. If you think in the past, how many, how many of these ideas have emerged and then you don't hear about them again? So right now we're waiting to see if, there's, uh, if there is good replication in different institutions for this finding. Interesting. Thank you so much. Could you just mute yourself again? And um, any other questions? Comments? Yes, Barbara, you want to unmute yourself? I, I unmuted you. Okay. I have two questions. I don't know how clearly I can ask them. Um, since most of the time there's uh, Alzheimer's underlying PCA, and PCA is a slow progression usually. Does the Alzheimer's that has started to show, or the symptoms started to show, does that also continue to progress slowly or do they progress at different rates? Well, when it's uh, the underlying pathology is Alzheimer's disease, it does progress slowly. And uh, it's just a different form of Alzheimer's disease. Um, we use the A word for all of these things, which uh, is not the same in the clinic, but because the pathologist sees the abnormal tau and the, and the amyloid deposition, then um, we call all of this uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it, it, yeah, they spread in tandem, really. Okay. Now the, now the original, the original patient, uh, you know, is 51 years old. Alois uh, uh, August. Dieter, um, Alois Alzheimer's uh, patient, and she was 51 uh, when he examined her. And she might have started in her late 40s. She, so she too is a, some kind of a variant. She really didn't have typical Alzheimer's disease clinically. Well, what I meant was uh, the memory issues, difficulty finding words sometimes. Um, those are really the main things. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, yes, I, I, those things that do uh, progress. And uh, it seems to progress in an anterior direction, uh, gradually affecting memory and word finding. Okay. Uh, nice. and, and it may be very slow, though. I want to emphasize that. that uh, that's uh, something about PCA is uh, there are many patients that's so slow in progression. Well, my second question is uh, either what are some of the specific instructions about how to manage this visual impairment or where do I find some specific instructions? That was on your last slide. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I would refer you to uh, uh, the, the Kang Wei uh, list and I, I think Jamie has it, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. I will get it to you. I'll put, post it on the Facebook. Uh, okay. Wonderful. Any? Uh, thank you so much, Barbara. Any other questions? Raise your hand or if you uh, are on the phone, you can uh, just, yes. Um, Mr. Cosgrove, Paul. So I was wondering um, what kind of things can be done to treat the depression that goes along with the PCA. Um, there's medications, but what other types of things can, can a caregiver do to help the patient with the depression that's involved? Well, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to emphasize to patients and caregivers that much of the brain is intact. This is a focal disorder in the back of the brain. And the perception part of the brain. And often uh, the, the frontal regions where personality, uh, where you feel somebody's presence, where their wit and, and uh, the essence of uh, much of what defines them as an individual uh, is intact. Uh, and other aspects of uh, brain function, uh, uh, other, many other brain has, you know, has, is a very complex organ with a lot of cog cognitive abilities are intact. And so patients need to be engaged. They need to be involved. They need to be participatory in life. Uh, that is the best for them. They cannot retreat uh, because they can't see. And so I tell them, your brain, you're not seeing. This is like a visual disorder. You're not seeing. 
but you can hear and you you can do other things you can interact you can do so many things uh that uh, uh they they have and of course if people are depressed they want they don't they don't want to initiate as much activity or be as participatory with their families or uh, and that's uh worse for the brain they have to they have to keep participating that's good for the brain it's stimulating uh as well as the range of medications uh, that we have. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. If you want to just um, never mind, I muted you. I have I, one other question before we we uh, end today, and that is, you said you're looking for antecedents, uh, environmental, behavioral, developmental. Any hints yet on on what why why PCA for for these for, for us? These uh, well, some studies have suggested autoimmunity may be involved. Uh, some investigators have considered uh, that uh, perhaps there's a predisposition uh, in uh, early life. People may have a predisposition uh, to a focal deterioration in that part of the brain as evidenced by their performance on visual processing and, and things of that nature. Uh, that's, that is about uh, the cognitive reserve theory, uh, neuronal reserve uh, theory, theories of uh, how the brain works. Uh, there are vulnerable areas and not so vulnerable areas for neuronal reserve. Uh, but other than that, we, we just don't know. Interesting, thank you. Well, this has been amazing and i'm so so grateful to you for coming to speak with us and we'll post this uh video and i thank you and hopefully you'll come back next year thank you very much i appreciate being invited into everybody's home thank you dr mendez hi thanks everybody